all for coming, and it is really uh, special to have Dr. Jean Hubble come. I've known her since the 80s. Uh, she was at o the Ohio State University. Go Bucks! <laughs> uh, and she was the director of the Parkinson's Disease and Movement Disorder Center for many years, uh, maybe eight or ten years. And then she went to work with industry, with a, a number of really well-known uh, pharmaceutical companies that focus on movement disorders. And so she's worked with, um, let's see, I wrote it down, there's a lot of Novartis, uh, Johnson & Johnson, Boringer, Ingelheim, and a number of other, but right now she's with U.S. World Meds, which uh, she's going to talk a bit more about what they're doing with the uh, very quick-acting dopamine agonist um, apomorphine apple that she um, will elucidate us about. Um, I think that's all I need to say about her. Um, she can speak for herself. Welcome, uh, Jean. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's really a pleasure to be here. Yeah, I'm all hooked up here, ready to go. Yeah, a, a, a really and sincerely a, a treat uh, to be invited to speak uh, to a group like this with patients and, and care partners and families. It reminds me, actually it's much more of a treat, but also more of a challenge than it is talking to physicians or, or scientists. It reminds me years ago, I, um, I think they, they still hold this. Rush Presbyterian St. Luke's in Chicago used to hold an annual meeting every fall. And when I was still at Ohio State University, I was invited to come there to be a faculty member. And it was a very ambitious symposium they put together every fall because it would be at a, one of the large hotels not too far from O'Hare Airport. And in one ballroom, they would have the physicians, what we call the continuing medical education course on Parkinson's disease. And there were maybe like four or five of us who were faculty members this particular year. And then in the other room, it would be patients, it'd be people like, like you all, patients, their families, friends, interested or the end dealing with Parkinson's disease. And this was so many years ago, it was back in the old days where we had these slide carousels, these chromosomes, these uh, codochromes. It was embarrassingly long ago. But I remember having a, a pre-meeting call with um, uh, Dr. Harold Polans at the time, was, was uh, since deceased, but was running all of this. And I said, I have to be honest with you, Dr. Polans, I'm kind of nervous about this, because how am I gonna have these slides that I'm gonna show to a physician group, and then I'm gonna pick those up, and then run down the hall, and I'm, I'm gonna have to show the same slides to the patient group? And he goes, yeah, I, I, I hear you. I hear you, it's a problem, it's a problem. You can't expect both of the groups to have the same degree of knowledge and expertise. He goes, those physicians are never gonna get up to speed with the patient group. And so, I apologize in advance if I've made this too simplistic. You can feel free to ask questions. Uh, both as we go along, just shout them out and stop me, or uh, certainly at the end, I know we'll have time, won't we Larry, to, to go over some things. All right, so here we go. I'm gonna kind of start with the bad news. There are challenges, a lot of challenges, particularly right now in 2014, in trying to develop new or improved therapies for Parkinson's disease. One of the biggest challenges, and I mean, we all face this now in our day-to-day -day life, are, is simply the economy. The soured economy has really um, had it both directly and indirectly um, has hampers us a bit in a number of ways. Industry, pharmaceutical industry, of course is how our economy affects us It'll, in many ways. The obvious one is just in the sale of the products, right? But one thing you may not uh, recognize is even you know private foundations, research and advocacy groups, uh, academia, all of them have um, fewer resources and therefore those resources get spread uh, around the um, you know, health and drug development arena. So, uh, so the economy is an, issue, uh, is an issue for us and continues to be. 
And the thing you may not realize about pharmaceutical industry is once a company has a marketed product, of course you're depending on the profits, the income from that product to, to duck back into your future research endeavors as well. And so when things get tight in the economy, when health insurers or Medicare either cut the payments to the physicians and uh, for uh, treatments, it, it not only has that obvious impact in making it harder for that patient right now potentially to get to purchase their medication, but it also has a negative long-term impact on the various companies, the commercial interest at hand, because that's what we're really depending on to, uh, to put back in to our future research. So I'm going to give you some examples of how we think at US World Meds. We're trying to be pretty clever and efficient about how we leverage uh, monies and opportunities that exist to keep things moving along. Um, and in particular, um, cost of drug development in the U.S. has really gone up in the last few years. It's a much, much trickier financial enterprise than it used to be. Um, examples, not so much in Parkinson's disease, but uh, a better, perhaps a better example in Alzheimer's disease. You can, uh, they, they, sometimes the cost from the time that you identify a molecule to the time you, you, know, you could potentially take it to market, you may spend up to $1 billion along the way to get that developed. The average time from the time you first discover a new molecule to, the, to you get to the market now has gone upwards of 15 years. And of course, very often during that time, you're closing in on your patent protection. So once you do go to market, you may only have a few years of patent protection before the, your, your product can become generic. We usually estimate that only 8%, 8% of new compounds ever make it to the market. By that I mean new compounds, I mean it got at least as far that we found a, a target molecule and probably started some initial human testing. Only 8% of those actually ever make it into the marketplace. But meanwhile, of course, you're dumping money to find that, that precious 8%. Less than one-third less than one out of three approved drugs ever recoup their investment cost. So it's a, um, I, I, it's, you know, uh, um, I was showing one of these slides to uh, my older son who works for a hedge fund, and he was just telling me, Mom, this is just an incredibly bad bet. They would never, they would never go after something like this. So uh, once, and then once, of course, a generic does hit the market, the revenue from uh, any given product declines well over now 80%, it's much, much closer to 90%. More challenges, unfortunately. I've already touched on this one, so I don't have to talk too much about this one. The laws and regulations in the U.S. do tend to slow us down in drug development. I think you've all heard and everybody kind of fusses around about the FDA and how long it takes to get things done with the FDA. But again, part of, our, part of the, the pressure for us is not only dealing with the regulators, the Food and Drug Administration, but also being mindful of that precious patent protection on our product. So we can, we can potentially, once we do finally have a successful product, we can recoup the investment. And then, if that weren't all bad enough, pharmaceutical industry does not have the finest of reputations. There's been various, these uh, Harris public surveys been done over the last several years. Here's one where I think they conduct this one every two or three years. Let me go here to the next one. Uh, this is a one, one done in 2012, so I think they'll be repeating this one again this year, 2014. And in this one, what they do is they ask, they ask uh, I don't know how many thousands of Americans, but they ask them to rate these 13 uh, industry sectors, ranging all the way from technologies to, uh, to tobacco. And uh, you can see that pharmaceuticals, and, and then you get a quotient, the higher the number, the better, meaning that you're more trusted, the higher the number. So the goal is to be 100%, meaning 
totally trustworthy. And you can see at pharmaceuticals, we're not even, we're just kind of hunkering down here at about 30, which is pretty pathetic. We're, we're just a little bit better than airlines and a, just a few touch better. I mean, the only people we can really look down on is tobacco. So uh, it is, it, it is an issue for us. And I'll have to be honest with you, I think some of it's been well deserved. Most of this was, you know, now a few, couple of decades ago, but there were really probably some egregious um, sales and marketing activities over the years. And um, because of laws and rules and regulations now in place, I firmly believe that that really is, has largely been eliminated, but we're still living with some of those rare misdeeds in the past in terms of our reputation. I think we're getting better, though, in terms of how people perceive us. And then, of course, there's the challenges in turn, turning bench work into treatment success. And by bench work, I mean, you know, truly that basic science, that laboratory work, finding that discovery and turning it into a successful treatment. And of course, uh, a case in point with that, uh, as many of you know, is the, um, the efforts that have been put around gene therapies or related interventions in Parkinson's disease had some very tantalizing basic science work for gene therapy. And perhaps we're getting a bit closer to making that a clinical reality, but there's certainly been a lot of dips in the road along the way. And, time permits, uh, Juan may want to uh, elaborate a bit more for you about that. And then let's kind of go to a brighter note. Let's uh, move off of the challenges and start talking about how can we leverage the opportunities? How can we build upon what's already there? Well, one way is this, trying to leverage, you know, uh, pressure, social and cultural pressures to, uh, to prompt greater emphasis and focus in Parkinson's disease. Of course, you know, we often uh, give as a best example of that the AIDS community now, you know, a few decades ago, but they certainly were able to kind of flip that switch in terms of public awareness and pressure on uh, both governmental and private foundations to, to, to lead to some breakthrough therapies. And I think there's examples, you know, of, of individuals, uh, groups, groups like this, groups like this led by Larry and Marilyn, and, and, and certainly in the world of Alzheimer's, we've seen that as well. I would argue, though, these conditions, including Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, I think we've, we've come a long ways, but we are not there yet in terms of being really clear and focused on what we want and who, who do we need it from. And so I, I still am uh, looking for that kind of more uh, integrated pressure uh, on society and government to, uh, to, to find not only the cure, but better treatments right now. Opportunities, another opportunities, there are some potential ways to innovate and even potentially lower, lower costs. Uh, one is, we, you can certainly take the targeted molecule approach. That means going all the way from the bench science, like gene therapy, and try to take it all the way to a clinical success. But sometimes, particularly in neurology, sometimes if you look at existing molecules, what we sometimes call the more empirical approach, you look at existing drugs that just have never been looked at or haven't been further perfected in Parkinson's disease, and we shouldn't give up on those, um, those kind of more easily achievable goals. The other thing I think that we have an opportunity to do, uh, and I think Larry's been a part of some of these collaborations with industry, clinical researchers, patient groups, even sometimes the FDA shows up and sits around the table, and healthcare insurers, because those kinds of collaborations can do a lot of things, not least of which is agreeing on what we're trying to do, find meaningful outcomes. And let me give you an example of what, how sometimes there's a disparity between these various stakeholders and what's a good outcome. Now I assume if I went around the room here, you would all have some pretty clear idea of what's a good outcome to you. That's physically you being better, and even better yet, protecting future generations, right, from Parkinson's. FDA, they would say, oh, it's a specific scale the Unified Parkinson's Disease Rating Scale. That's what a drug company has to do to get their drug approved. There's other scales, too. Um, a health insurer might say, show me that your new treatment cuts down on costs 
for that patient's care, right? So they've got a very different outcome of what's good in their back of their mind. And so the, the more we can get all these people who have vested interest in Parkinson's treatments to agree what is our goal, what is good, and uh, that's trickier than you might think. And, and the, but there are some efforts to collaborate. Now I'm going to switch. Kind of that was uh, the kind of huge uh, 30,000 foot view of what are our challenges and some of our opportunities in developing new and better treatments for Parkinson's disease. And now I'm going to uh, switch gears totally and tell you a little bit about our company, US World Meds, and what we're doing in Parkinson's disease. It is based in Louisville, Kentucky, and uh, it's what we call a specialty pharmaceutical company. That's kind of a fancy word for saying we're real small. We're not like Pfizer with 60-some thousand employees. We have about 100 employees in the United States. It's still fairly young. Uh, company. It was established in March of 2001 uh, and, uh, and, and is privately held, which is, which is a nice thing in Parkinson's disease work like we do because it makes for a very um, quick decision making, meaning we don't have stockholders, you know, we don't have a huge board of directors. It doesn't take our company six to nine months to make a decision. So being privately held is, uh, is I think, a very uh, good uh, aspect to our work. And I already mentioned it, it we're a small company. And we do particularly focus on what we call specialty pharmaceuticals. And you're, I'll show you some examples in Parkinson's disease in a moment. Uh, those are drugs that, the, well, the, basically the easiest way to think about them, they're not pills. You can't just run down to CVS and get them. These are specialty, specialty pharmaceutical products, mostly that are injectable and therefore you have to get them through a certain type of pharmacy uh, and not just a, um, you know, a mom and pop pharmacy or the CVS. So one of our drugs that we've had, uh, that we bought the rights to um, now about four years ago, I think, is called Myoblock. It is a botulinum toxin. So you can think of it, it's much like Botox. There's a little bit of chemical difference, but it's much like Botox. Um, everybody's heard of Botox mostly because of its use in, um, in cosmetics, obviously. But actually, just like Botox, Myoblock is really originally designed for therapeutic use in movement disorders. Not originally for Parkinson's disease, so myoblock again is a type of to botulinum toxin. Um, the first use in man, and this was one of the first uses for Botox as well, was for cervical dystonia. It is not the same as Parkinson's disease, but those of you that have painful muscle cramps, maybe where your um, toes curl up, um, uh, that's dystonia. There are some people who get dystonia like that of their neck muscles. Again, doesn't have anything to do with Parkinson's disease, but it's another movement disorder. And so cervical dystonia patients, you can actually take a botulinum toxin, which weakens muscles temporarily, and you can inject it in the muscles of the neck and relax those unwanted painful contractions. So Myoblock has been approved and available in the United States for that use for several years. So what the heck, why am I bringing this up? What's this got to do with Parkinson's disease? Well, we've known for a long time that Myoblock also is very good to control drooling. The medical term for that is sialuria. And so uh, even today, many physicians, uh, injectors, neurologists primarily, but other physicians who inject botulinum toxins, they'll inject the salivary glands. Those are uh, the one set of them is called the parotid glands. They're right up here, kind of right in front of your, uh, 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 about an inch or so in front of your earlobes. And uh, you can inject that area and these toxins will help dry up those unwanted secretions. And of course, in Parkinson's disease, that can happen. It can happen in other neurological conditions too. ALS patients often have trouble with drooling. Cerebral palsy patients, particularly older adults with cerebral palsy, often have trouble with drooling. Sometimes stroke can cause copious problems with drooling that can actually you know, be, be quite um, um, 
more than just a you know embarrassment to a patient, but can actually cause skin breakdown around the uh, the lips and mouth. So um, you can physicians can inject right now myobloxer sialuria. Insurance companies reimburse for it. In fact, just recently in the uh, state of Florida. The uh, Medicare uh, carrier for the state of Florida, First Coast, recently announced that they reimbursed for um, myoblock injections for sialuria, including in Parkinson's disease. But we wanted to take that at our company one step further and actually get the FDA to approve its use. Because remember what I was saying about the bad economy, it's probably going to be that way for some time, at least in terms of constricting healthcare resources. So we want to make sure and have the FDA approve this use so that you know five years from now, ten years from now, patient groups like your own won't be denied access to a, a very effective drug like this for sialuria. So we did one of what we call phase two study, it's kind of a beginning step study with sialuria, myoblock in drooling. And we took it to the FDA, and the FDA said, this is so positive, we're going to count this as one of your final studies. And so now we just are completing, uh, kind of midway, in completing a, what we call a confirmatory, a second study for myoblock and sialuria. And the way we look at it, obviously it's good for us, good for our business, to have the only approved drug for this use. But the other thing is, it's good for patients and the general public to make sure and get that FDA approval so that you, we can guarantee access moving forward for the treatment of a symptom like drooling or sialuria in Parkinson's disease. Now I'm going to move to what um, our bigger focus is within our company in Parkinson's disease. And it's an old drug. This drug was actually known about since the late 1800s called apomorphine. And uh, I'm not going get this part of it over with right now. Everybody hears that word morphine and they think, oh my goodness, it's, it's, you know, it's addicting. It has nothing to do with that word morphine like uh, you know and hear about related to narcotics and painkillers and addiction. Nothing to do with it at all. The chemical structure is somewhat similar, but it has no narcotic properties. And people sometimes, uh, actually I was doing a patient support group near Baltimore a few months ago, and somebody you know, quickly challenged me on that, well, why just change the name then? That's stupid, don't call it that. And so, and, okay, point well taken, but chemists would say it's the right name, because that's just the chemical name. And they said, well, how can that be then? How is it not, not just like morphine? And I said, well, you know, you may have uh, at home in your medicine cabinet, you may have a, a bottle of isopropyl alcohol, rubbing alcohol, right? And you call that alcohol. In your other medicine cabinet, you may have an aged scotch whiskey sitting there. You could call that alcohol, but you don't expect them to have the same effects, right? So it's the same thing. These are just, just chemical terms, morphine. So this is apomorphine, and we've had this, uh, this product, one product right now, that's an injectable, and I'll spend most of my time on it. Uh, it's kind of like an insulin injection or uh, an EpiPen. So Apokin is our current product, been on the market for a few years. Actually, we are the fourth company to take on Apokin. Nobody's been able to make it successful. So it was released in 2004. We're the first company, we've had the rights to it now almost two years, and we're the first company to finally be generating a profit on that. I'll tell you about the support resources and things we had to put behind it to get there. So we have a lot of new uh, educational activities with Apokin, that's its brand name, and support services. But because we've been able to turn this product around, the current delivery system of Apokin in the US, finally making a profit off of it, now we're going to go and uh, develop the drug in a different delivery system called apomorphine pump therapy. And it's really pretty exciting. So I'll end the presentation with that in a moment. Well, I already, I already gave this part away. Apomorphine's been around for a long, long time. And uh, however, it causes, can cause serious nausea and vomiting. So it wasn't until anti-emetics or anti-nausea drugs were developed that it could start finally being used 
first in the United Kingdom and then in some other European countries. So it had been around for quite some time, particularly tested in Parkinson's in the, in the UK. And then finally in 2004, this version of the product, Apicon, was uh, marketed, FDA approved, and then we acquired it in early 2012. I want to take a step back before, because uh, before we get into why Apica, who can benefit from it, what's the good, what's the bad about it, let's step back and remind ourselves about uh, Parkinson's disease and <coughs> levodopa. So I'm just going to let this play. You're going to see that you know this uh, gentleman in the pajamas here, patient with Parkinson's, trying to stand up from a chair. Now you might think, well, that you know you put the camera on pause. But not, not at all. He you know, is so slow, so bradykinetic is the term we use, that he even cannot stand up from a chair. It's like he just ceases to move for a moment. Now he's being assisted up by a medical student. And, and you're probably all uh, probably uh, shocked at the poor quality of the film. But it's because this is uh, a film from actually, uh, I think it was take, pr first uh, put together in 1969. Uh, it was at the University of Kansas in Kansas City. And it was actually the first patient they put on levodopa. Back in those days, levodopa wasn't available from any manufacturer. You just got the whole, it was just powder, uh, levodopa powder that uh, the, patient, uh, to the patient takes. Now, he's not on it yet. Um, I just showed this part to remind us how untreated Parkinson's disease, and this is a gentleman in his late 50s, untreated Parkinson's disease, how severe the symptoms can be, even in this individual who's, you know, who's uh, you know, not yet reached 60 years of age. Obviously, the doctor's trying to have him tap his fingers. You saw his wife help him walk because he has problems with gait and balance. And it's very, very, very slow um, movements, including his hands, but even standing and walking. The reason he's in uh, these pajamas, this is actually a hospital. Uh, this was actually his hospital guard, because back in those days, when levodopa was given just by itself, it, uh, patients were routinely hospitalized to begin levodopa therapy, because it also can cause severe nausea and vomiting. So here is the same uh, gentleman a couple of weeks later. Now he's taking levodopa. Wow. And of course, I mean, this is, uh, you know, we, uh, we take for granted these drugs we now have for Parkinson's, but uh, when, this, when levodopa first came out, I obviously was too young to remember that even me, but when levodopa first came out, it was called the Lazarus drug because literally people who almost couldn't get up and walk were able to finally get up and walk again. So this is levodopa, and this is obviously the good news about levodopa, right? This is, this is great stuff. When levodopa is first prescribed, it usually provides this kind of, kind of like being shot out of a cannon, a nice, rapid, reliable, sustained benefit. It usually kicks in at about 20, maybe 30 minutes, and usually you, you with your doctor can, can work out how to go from dose to dose. Usually its effects last from dose to dose. Before I go on though to what the problems are with levodopa, what its shortcomings are over time, I stressed to you before that the reason that gentleman was in the hospital garb was because uh, he had to receive IV fluid because before he got used to the levodopa because he had such nausea and vomiting. Um, most of you will recognize now that we don't usually give levodopa by itself. It's usually paired up with carbidopa, right? So most of you are on carbidopa, levodopa, or you might use the word cinnamet, or you might use the word stilevo that has that carbidopa with levodopa. So carbidopa doesn't go into the brain to treat your Parkinson's symptoms. Carbidopa helps reduce the nausea and vomiting associated with levodopa. Merck Sharp and Dome was the company that it was 1970s that first came out with carbidopa coupled with levodopa. They decided it was such a breakthrough because, uh, for this combination pill, they named it Cinemet, Cine Emet. Any Latin scholars in the room? What's Cine mean? S-I-N-E. Without. without. So without emesis, 
They didn't name the drug for Parkinson's disease. They were so proud of the drug, they named it without emesis because finally they were able to give levodopa in a way that didn't produce this severe nausea and vomiting. The reason I bring that up, I mentioned before, morphine can do that as well, can cause nausea and vomiting. All strong dopaminergic drugs, all drugs that have that kind of chemical reaction, can cause, when you first start them, usually it goes away, when you first start them, they have a higher risk of causing nausea and vomiting. But you, you can get over that very quickly in the case of levodopa and with apomorphine when we talk about it in a moment as well. But of course the bad side of levodopa for some patients, not all, but for some, is over the course of time, patients start losing that nice, reliable, predictable response. Sometimes they take a dose here in the first bullet and it has a very slow onset. Sometimes it can be 20 minutes, that's nice and quick. Sometimes it might be 60 minutes. So that's what we call delayed time to on. Also, the effects sometimes wear off before it's time to take the next dose. We call that end of dose wearing off. In other words, say it used to be able to make take a pill at 7 a.m. of Cinemat or Stilevo, and you used to make it all the way to 11 a.m. when it's time for your next dose, but now you start finding, boy, about 10, 10.30, I'm wearing off. My symptoms are coming back. Some doses fail to work at all. So it's like you took a blank, almost like you took a placebo. You just took a pill in the say, first thing in the morning and you never kick in. It's what we call morning off. And then some doses work too well and cause those involuntary or wiggly movements. So generally when you see Michael J. Fox on television or in you know, various shows or interviews, he has those kind of uh, twitchy or wiggly movements. He's very good about kind of working them into his, his uh, routine. But that, of course, isn't his Parkinson's. That's a side effect from his levodopa and other drugs he's on. It's like it's too much stimulation in his brain at that particular moment. So it is this roller coaster ride, this unpredictability of levodopa that apomorphine can help with. So Apican, as I already mentioned, that's the brand name for our current version of apomorphine in the US. It is not a narcotic. It is what we call a dopamine agonist. And, and uh, Dr. Juan here has the, has, knows so much more about pharmacology than I, than I do. I don't want to embarrass myself too much with my, uh, by saying this, but it is a dopamine agonist. So some of you also may be on drugs like Mirapex or Nupro, the skin patch, or Requip, also called Ropinerol. Those are also dopamine agonists, but unlike apomorphine, none of those produce a true levodopa-like effect. They're beneficial, but they don't usually pr produce that black and white, like we saw with the fellow in the pajamas, that big on effect. Apomorphine has been demonstrated to do that. I already mentioned it's been available outside the U.S. for many years. And uh, I just at the very bottom put what it's useful for, but instead of me talking this fancy FDA jargon, let's uh, instead see a patient about this uh, uh, younger woman in her, um, in her late 30s. Dana is the mother of a toddler. She's already had Parkinson's disease for several years, so she got it at a young age. And uh, when she became pregnant two years ago, she had such severe fluctuating response to her levodopa that she really had to go to bed rest throughout most of her pregnancy. She had a lot of problems with delayed time to on and dose failures. Here she is uh, off. She purposely held her Cinemat dose so we could do this, this filming when she's off. But of course, almost like the, the gentleman in the pajamas, the old film, same idea, all our Parkinson's symptoms are back. Uh, so we call this an off episode when levodopa is no longer working in the brain. And you can see I, I eventually, I stopped uh, the examination because she simply can't make any hand, really meaningful hand movements, cannot stand up at all, uh, unless we have two people on either side of her. Now she's being given an injection of Apican, and again, it's just like an insulin shot. You just, it's a tiny little needle that you uh, put a shot right into the sub-Q uh, fat, subcutaneous fat. This is her four minutes later. 
and then we have up in the corner, we have pre-filming as well, the, the pre-injection film as well. But you can see it turns her right on. Steady hands. You'll see in a moment she's going to have really good hand use. This is the same effect she gets when her levodopa cinemat works at its best, but she can't depend on her cinemat to do that every time. So instead, she gives herself, as needed, an apican injection to tide her over until her next oral pills finally kick in. So I tell patients you can think of apican like levodopa in a syringe. Doesn't do anything more than your best levodopa response. But if you're someone who can do things when your levodopa works, but you can't depend on it to work every time the same way, then you can give yourself a shot instead of apican because again, it's like levodopa in a syringe, works in 10 to 20 minutes. Only lasts about 60 to 90 minutes because it's intended to have that short duration. It's just as needed to tide you over to your medicine finally kicks in. So this is from one of our original studies, and it really just demonstrates that you get a levodopa-like effect with the drug. Uh, what's shown in the little red bo uh, boxes are patients who were taking a placebo injection that day, and that's compared to patients in the blue uh, triangle or rectangles that are uh, on apican. And we know that these kinds of scores, these, this kind of drop in these, the scale, the Unified Parkinson's Disease Rating Scale, this is the same response they get when their levodopa works at its best. The other thing this study showed us, these were all patients who had been on um, apican for many uh, months. I think the average was 14 months before they were part of this particular study. And what we know from this is once you find the right dose of apican, once you find the, what we call the optimal dose, higher, you don't need to go to higher doses over time. So that was actually studied in this particular project. So sometimes people ask me, well, I don't know if I want to use a shot because I'll get, I want to develop uh, you know, resistance to it over time. This study showed us absolutely not. Yes, sir? A fast question. Please. Will able can increase your dyskinesia or can it impact it? Yeah, good, good question. Absolutely it can. And I, and I think you were probably already on track with this. If it works just like levodopa, except every single time, if, you're, if you get dyskinetic when your levodopa is at its peak effects, it'll probably cause that same degree of dyskinesia. Goes away then as soon as it wears off in 60 to 90 minutes. And um, just another way of looking, different scale. It's we time how fast people can walk a certain number of feet. It's no, not another one of these typical things you use uh, when you're doing uh, FDA studies in Parkinson's. And we see here that even at seven and a half minutes. That's that first set of bars on the far left chart. Even at seven and a half minutes, clearly there was an improvement in timed walking uh, in the light blue bars as compared to the uh, dark blue, which was the placebo injection. So I'm going to move from uh, how Apican works to identifying then potential patients. I think you probably have already kind of understood this. Apican's intended for people who respond to levodopa, but they're experiencing these off episodes. And in particular, I think it works best, or it's easier to understand how it works in a patient, uh, to estimate its benefit in an individual. If a, if a person can tell me, okay, when levodopa works and I am on, I can play nine holes of golf. But if my levodopa wears off or doesn't kick in that time, that dose, I don't even leave the house. So it's really that, it's not, it's not for people who wear levodopa never works or never helps a particular symptom. Say somebody has balance problems. And it doesn't matter what the doctor does with their levodopa dose, takes it up, takes it down, adds helper pills, the balance problem just stays steady as she goes. Nothing ever helps it. Apican's not going to help that either. Because again, it's like levodopa in a syringe. 
Um, the other thing, because it's an injectable and you do have to, it's, I, we think it's easy to inject, but on the other hand, you have to know when to inject it. It is, it is uh, more difficult to use if you have problems with thinking. Uh, it's usually easier than if there's a care partner nearby who, who knows how to do the injection if needed. Some of the mm, times we think, ah, this may not be the way to go. If, you, if a person has a lot of problems with thinking or confusion or even hallucinations with their other Parkinson drugs, you probably want to sort all of that out first before you would try a drug like Levit or Apican because it's so potent. You wouldn't want it to, to, to cause further problems in that arena. Same thing, we had a great question earlier about if a person has what we call troublesome dyskinesia. I don't mean just mild wiggly movements sometimes at the peak effects of your drug, but really severe, kind of think, you know, Michael J. Fox times 10. If you have really severe dyskinesia like that, that almost knocks you off your feet, you're gonna, it's gonna be that or even worse when you take a shot of Apican. So it's better to sort that out first before trying Apican. And then of course, if you have a lot of other, and this is the case for all Parkinson's medicines, if you have some other serious medical conditions, all Parkinson drugs can be more difficult to manipulate or titrate. That include like a heart valve transplant or? As long as it's stable, as long as it's stable, that, so by, by significant I really mean where your, most of the attention to your day-to-day -day medical care is directed at other problems like unstable heart disease or uh, uh, you know very severe lung disease as well. Yes, ma'am. Just have a question about you're talking about taking a dose of irregular like Stilevo and then not taking the effect or just to come on you. How would you know when to do this? I mean, I would be afraid like I would be like doubling up or something. Yeah, and so you know what um, what we have found actually in a recent study we're just published. So we're going to be reporting it out at the next neurology meeting here at the end of the month. But we looked at, at individuals who have these motor fluctuations, these ups and downs, these off episodes, and we looked particularly at folks who didn't kick in in the morning with their usual levodopa dose. In other words, they were way, having to wait 45 minutes, 60 minutes. Occasionally, they never kicked in in their morning dose. We call that morning akinesia. We think that that's due to a couple things. Obviously, if you haven't taken any pills since 10 p.m. the night before, all those medicines from the night before are gone. So, but, but it's more than that because these individuals will take a dose of Cinema or Stilevo and uh, they, don't, they can't ever tell when it's gonna kick in. So it's probably, that problem is also probably due to uh, GI gastrointestinal problems with your Parkinson's as well. We know the stomach tends to slow down and the intestines slow down when a person is off. Just like they're slow moving, like, like when you saw our young woman uh, Dana a moment ago, slow moving externally, it's like their intestines are slow moving as well. And so if, if you don't digest and absorb a dose of levodopa, none gets into the brain, right? So you don't get a benefit. Apican, on the other hand, because it's injected, you don't depend on the GI tract for it. It goes right around it. You don't need the gut to be working properly. So Apican works virtually every time within 10 to 20 minutes. The reason I bring that up to your question about when to use it, how to use it, what was interesting about this study is not only did patients, no surprise, turn them on regularly every morning in the study, but then one of the investigators were telling them, well, you know, most of my patients, not only did they stay on Apican, they started using it throughout the day whenever they turned off, at, you know, and not at a fixed time, like first thing in the morning, but turned off, say, in the middle of the afternoon, or maybe they were out to dinner at a restaurant, and they suddenly turned off. So I do think it's easier to start using it like that at a fixed time of the day, perhaps in the morning, until you know how you're gonna react to it, and then you get a feel for, here's when I'm gonna use it. Here's the time of the day I'm, I think I might be able to use it. So yeah. you can use it instead of your stimulant in the morning? You, you can.
can, especially if, if your Stilebos and other drugs aren't working. So the way we would usually, and, and you really always you know, have to work with your individual doctor on something like this, but one way to handle it could be, uh, so we have some patients I know that I know of who uh, literally leave you know, the Apican uh, pen right by their bedside and so they or, or their care partner give them an injection as soon as they wake up in the morning. That way they kick right in, they can go to the, the restroom, they can bathe, they can you know, have breakfast, etc. And then they maybe go ahead and take their, their regular oral medicines maybe 30 minutes or, uh, or so later because that way by the time those kick in, the Apican's wearing off. And once you kind of get a feel for that, then it's easier to know how to use it as needed later in the day. Did that kind of answer your question? I just about the two overlapping and being too much for you. Yeah, yeah, and now, uh, usually people can get a pretty good sense of that. Yes, ma'am? Can you take too much of the applicant? Yeah, so we, we recommend two things. Well, let me, you know what, this is perfect, perfect timing because my next section is going to be on optimal dosing. So if you don't mind, we'll address it as we go forward with this. So finding the optimal dose is really important. The optimal dose has to be as good as levodopa. And you can base that either with the person just says, this is, this is great, or, or clinicians have little tools or assessments that they can use as well. The optimal dose should kick in quickly, usually by about 10 to 15 minutes, and last from 60 to 90 minutes. Uh, if the optimal dose isn't found, no surprise, people stop taking it. Why would you inject yourself if it didn't seem to be working for you, right? So it's really important at the beginning of therapy to find the right dose. So we do that by having what we call an initiation. And this gets to the point uh, that someone else made, I think, also about what are some of the side effects. We mentioned dyskinesia. Well, apican for some individuals, can lower their blood pressure, particularly when they first start on it, or it can cause nausea. So we start apican in a certain way. We give a patient, uh, an individual, uh, a three days worth of an anti-nausea drug called Tigan, and we usually keep them on that for a couple of weeks. We give them an initial, what we call, test injection. Uh, that's 0.2 milliliters, or CC. Uh, and that's just marked on the little pen device. And then we actually check the blood pressure just to make sure they're doing fine. And we also make sure if they have like dyskinesia or other problems, but most importantly, we wanna make sure they're improved. And if they do okay on that test dose, you can do one of two things. You can either send them home and uh, just have them use it as needed, and then check again and see, okay, maybe it's time to go up a little bit. And so then we can go up by 0.1 uh, milliliters every few days as needed. Now you might say, well, that's a lot of work. And uh, if I was Dr. Sanchez Ramos, I'd be sitting there thinking, gee, you gotta be kidding. I don't have time for people to be doing this in my clinic all the time. This could take hours and days. They can't, they can't be bouncing back and forth, right? So what we do, Let's get through that one. What we've done then for, as a company is we've offered these support services. And one important support service we offer is called the Circle of Care Nurse Program. So we have trained nurses. They're trained not just in Parkinson's disease, but they're specifically trained in apican use. They can come to your doctor's office or even to your home if that's easier, if that's what your doctor agrees is best for you so that they can assist with the initiation, they can check the blood pressure, they can see how you do, call back in a couple of days, see how you're doing, let the doctor know, you know, it may sound like they need their dose bumped up just a smidge. So they can really be that facilitator and educator working closely with you and your physician. And I mentioned earlier that we were the first company to finally start making a pro uh, profit off of this drug in parts because we put these kinds of resources in play. Some of the other things we've uh, done in addition to this nurse educator program called Circle of Care at the bottom left in this uh, circle, um, uh, you'll see some of the others as you read around reimbursement services, financial assistance, and then we work through some specific specialty pharmacies that directly ship Apican to the patient. Um, we take on, once a doctor fills out the form to start Apican, we take on, we have a, a third party vendor, we don't get the patient's names or information, but then they 
uh, source out whether you know how insurance uh, coverage will be if it's private insurance Medicare or other governmentals then uh, if if you have private insurance like a United Healthcare uh, we US World Mass we pick up the entire copay if you don't if it's Medicare then uh, our, this third party refers them to an assistance fund to help with the copay as well. And that's really reduced any kind of financial burden with APICON. And then um, it, though all of these things together uh, have really changed uh, both the use of APICON in the United States. It's still not for everyone with Parkinson's, only for people who have these ups and downs with their levodopa. But it's not only changed um, the number of patients in the United States that are using the drug, but also how long they're staying on it. And uh, to me, that's great because it not only changes the individual patient's lives, but it's allowing us to take those resources and put it back into future research with apomorphine. Apomorphine outside the United States is also available as a continuous infusion. Um, through a, a little pump mechanism. No surgery involved. It just is an, a, a plastic needle that sticks into the skin. And uh, if you have a friend or know someone who's on an insulin pump for diabetes, exactly the same idea. Just like they want to have insulin steady as she goes all day long, it's apomorphine steady as she goes all the waking day. So it's exactly the same idea. And again, we've already met with the FDA and uh, we are right now in the final phases of uh, planning a clinical trial. We, FDA agreed that we only need one. And that's a good thing from the FDA. They usually require two. The FDA says we only need one placebo-controlled study. So we'll, uh, we'll start that. We're starting what we call site identification in the middle of the year. And we intend to start the study by the end of the year. It looks uh, like, like this, gives you an idea of the pump itself is uh, about is uh, smaller than uh, the palm of man's hand and then the the liquid is the apomorphine is this liquid that's in the clear part of the syringe and you can see this individual on the right hand side has um, uh, he puts it in himself each morning and uh, it just pops right into the skin and he wears that pump then around like a, with a waistband uh, all the waking day and then takes it off at night before he goes to bed, starts the whole thing again the next morning. I'm gonna, before I take questions, I'm just gonna show this last. Ken is a Mepican patient. Oh, and you can look if we can turn down the volume. He's sorry, he was troubled by significant off episodes. But he is. I can That's why Ken's doctor was shaking him anyway. But uh, this is a fellow who, uh, for a doctor's visit. Uh, his doctor, you'll see him, I think, in a moment, is uh, Dr. Richard Dewey from uh, Dallas, Texas. And this individual up in the little left hand column, that's where he was before his injection. And then this is uh, the same fellow uh, with uh, his apican working. You can see again, it makes it just like with Dana, huge difference. He was barely able to stand before apican when he's off. But just like with his best levodopa response, when his apican works, he's able to get up and go. Uh, so we'll, we'll, I think I'll end on that because that's a pretty good place to uh, I think to end on. And um, Juan, do you want to join me back up front, maybe for some other questions? Are you okay with that? Has, has your company done any research on maple cream? Maple cream? Uh, no, and it's interesting you say that. And I don't know if uh, Juan, if you want to also help me with this one. Certain, certain chemicals, um, and apomorphine, my understanding is one, are not that easily absorbed across the skin. People have looked at it though in or orally and nasally because you can get some absorption across the nasal mucosa and, and the mouth as well. I use um, it um, Are you sure it's apomorphine, sir? Okay. Yeah. Well, there's a specialty pharmacy that formulates it for a number of my patients, and uh, 
Uh, I've never actually prescribed it. I wondered where the egg market comes from. Does it come from your company? It does or not. They just, no, so in, they nor, nor, nor the, the UK manufacturer that oversees all of the injectable apple morphines is called Britannia. And I, I can assure you it doesn't come from Britannia either. But you can get it, you know, if, like I said, it's been around since the 1800s. It's a chemical, so you can get it. I guess I, what I'm, I just don't know is I, I'm not aware of any research with those kinds of applications that gives you this big boost like you see with these injections. That's excellent. Oh yeah, so he was asking about, apparently you can get through uh, some what we call compounding pharmacies, yes. I'm guessing yes. is what, what it would be. Um, a combination of Parkinson drugs in a skin cream. And what I was saying is there can, there's a lot of challenges around getting some of these. It has to do with the chemistry of these, um, these compounds. And it's not always easy to get it across the skin. It's the same reason we don't give it orally. You have to give such big doses of apomorphine orally that it basically sh will shut down potentially your kidney or li uh, and liver uh, because it's so poorly absorbed orally. Yes, sir. Well, I have two concerns. Uh, Agent seems to work so well. I'm wondering, after you use Agent during the day, does the cinnamon have much effect later on during the day? Yeah. Your apricot is so good. And then I was curious about the shelf life. Yeah. Okay. Because I have some pretty smart in 2012. Okay. Okay. Well, that's a tough one. You know, uh, let me take the last one first. The last question is, what? A, <coughs> how long is, <coughs> pardon me, Apa can last? What's its shelf life? And it does have a long shelf life. Depends when when it's manufactured and shipped, but it does have a long shelf life. And and the the easy answer uh, for me is you know as the manufacturer, my recommendation is always you, you really should pay attention to expiry of medications, particularly in injectable, and particularly a drug like apomorphine, because over time, and I don't mean just like months, but over years time, particularly if it's left out in sunlight, it can do it can be oxidized, and so that takes away some of its potency. And so I, I hate to say this to you, but but I would I would pay attention to that expiry date. Uh, and your first question is, uh, we know from studies, and I showed you that one that went on for more than uh, 14 months, I think it ultimately went to 18 months before it was uh, stopped, it was mostly a safety study. We know from that study there was no indication that uh, you lose effect of any of your other Parkinson drugs over time when you use Apican. I was in that study. Oh, good for you. <laughs> Excellent. I mean, where is, was it, uh, what, where was the study site, if I might ask? Okay, great, great. Yeah, yeah, with Dr. Hauser. Oh, great. Yeah, all right, fair enough. That's why I've got so much aging in it. He said the maximum goes to seven a day. So when he told us prescription for me, he sent me seven a day, and I never used it that much. I used it every, well, probably every four days, maybe once or twice. Yeah, I see. Yeah, yeah, and and uh, quite honestly, in terms of um, if you if you're running out of uh, medication that doesn't have a, you know that doesn't have a current expiry date on it, then the best thing to do is either to work through your doctor, or you should have an 800 number about how to how to get uh, you know a new supply as well. Yeah, I want to go back to the first medication you mentioned that was used for cerebral dystonia. Yes, yeah, cervical dystonia. Cervix just okay. means neck. Yeah. Um, my question is: Is it effective on the dystonias as side effects of sleep? Yeah, it's a very. Can I give you that one? You might. Because. Yeah, oh, actually, uh, I I personally never inject patients with focal dystonias, but there are um, three or four of my patients that, that develop a severe dystonia, usually cervical dystonia, uh, with Parkinson's disease. The, the disease itself is actually a generalized dystonia. You don't get to see it these days that way because of levodopa. But in the old days, people would have a final fixed dystonic posture. And some of my patients, even though they do well on levodopa and dopamine agonists, will develop dystonia that waxes and wanes as the drug wears on and off, but eventually becomes almost a fixed cervical dystonia, maybe with a little movement, those patients do well with Botox. In fact, I send them to Dr. Hauser or to other uh, neurologists. They inject every three months, and 
It helps. Yeah. So, would that dystonia have developed without levodopa? For sure. But with levodopa, it seemed to never improve. Whereas many dystonias, uh, for example, the dystonias that are the heralding of the first signs of the disease, like the foot dystonia, well, that gets better with levodopa. But eventually, the drug itself can produce dystonia. As the drug wears off, dystonia can reappear. And in a few of my patients, dystonia is really troublesome, and it occurs whether they're on levodopa or not. And those are candidates for um, you know, what I would say for Botox, which works beautifully. You may ask, do they just have cervical dystonia and Parkinson's disease? Well, that's a possibility. But, but typically, dystonia is not surprising to see in Parkinson's disease. And for really difficult cases of dystonia, then yes. And it, it doesn't have to be just the neck. It could be a foot dystonia, for example, that's persistent. You could do that. I think we'll take one more question. I, have, I actually have a question. <laughs> because um, this is one of the reasons I haven't been using uh, applicant in the past, or I might in the future, probably will, um, is that the extreme nausea and vomiting that it elicits. Now, tolerance develops in many patients to that. But when you first initiate them, it's invariable that you're going to get nauseous and vomit. So the, what I'd always heard that was being done was to use a, an anti-nausea drug. You mentioned Tigan. But most anti-nausea drugs block dopamine receptors and actually worsen Parkinsonism. So w the one that I would use was uh, Domperidone, which is only available in England and Canada. People would bring it in, even with levodopa. Sometimes they're so nauseous. I'll, I'll give them a prescription for domperidone, but I would never give them prescriptions for all the kind of antiemetics like Tigan, because as a pharmacologist, I was raised and believe in this concept that all of the antiemetic drugs block dopamine receptors in that part of the blood-brain barrier that is there is no barrier called the the, the tr chemoreceptive trigger zone. It's where dopamine tickles that center and causes you to vomit. So how is it that you can use Tigan and not worsen their Parkinsonism? Well, I guess I might already know the answer. It's because you only use Tigan for a few days and then you stop it. Yeah, a, a couple of things. Um, Tigan um, is an older oral drug, an anti-nausea drug. Uh, it was used in all of our studies that led to FDA approval for Apican. Starts is usually for the studies. We usually started it three days ahead of time and then continued it for a week or two or so afterwards, and then dis discontinued it at the physician or investigator's discretion. Um, and so you're absolutely right. Like I said earlier, with levodopa as well, in the, from the old days with levodopa. Um, we know that uh, these strong dopaminergic drugs can cause nausea and vomiting. And so even with Tigan in our clinical studies, uh, maybe about uh, not so much vomiting, that did occur in a certain percentage, but upwards of 10 to 15 percent of patients have at least a wave of nausea or felt nauseated. But less than 2 percent actually stopped being in these long-term safety studies. So to your point, the common, does it always work? No. It appears that Tigan's a mild enough or well tolerated enough anti-emetic that it seems to be okay for individuals with Parkinson's and at least enough to take the edge off that for most patients they can go on and continue to have a good therapeutic effect. But I don't want to try to fool anyone in the room. It can cause nausea or vomiting, and every once in a while we'll just have somebody who just can't stand to take it. Yeah, well, every anti-Parkinson dopaminergic drug can cause nausea and vomiting, that's clear. But uh, I was always puzzled by the fact that the Tigan didn't seem to cause worsening or uh, yeah. of the Parkinsonism. I think if you use Tigan and chronically over a long period of time, you probably would worsen Parkinsonism. But. Perhaps. We, we actually did, um, not because we wanted to, because the FDA required it. We did it after the drug was released, after APIC was released, the FDA asked us, requested, um, it's what we call post-marketing commitment study. We actually looked not uh, experimentally at Apican, all the everybody got Apican, 
just for this problem, off episodes. But some patients got assigned placebo instead of Tigan, and then some people got started on Tigan and then went off quickly, and then uh, others stayed on Tigan for, I think it was up to 12 weeks. So it turns out that, no surprise, not everybody in the placebo group got nausea, but they did more than in the Tigan group. Their, you, their ra Parkinson's rating scales were no worse whether you took Tigan or not. And uh, after a few weeks, then it didn't really matter. It didn't matter if yeah. there was no difference between the long-term group on Tigan and the shorter-term group. So I guess the way I would interpret this, the Tigan doesn't appear to get into the brain to any great degree and block the brain's dopamine receptors. It seems to only block those at the border of the brain and blood. That's probably the explanation. That's how the domperidone is supposedly working. It's peripherally acting dopamine receptor antagonist that's used to prevent nausea and vomiting. And I always thought Tigan did get into the brain, but I guess not. That would suggest... At, at least not in a clinically significant yeah, way. Yeah, yeah. I feel better about that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right, I'd like to uh, thank our doctors. Very interesting. Okay, that uh, concludes our Best the Doctors program. And uh, hope to see you again.